Good afternoon. Um, I, it's a lovely packed house, but with Dulat Saab, how can you expect anything less? Um, and um, it's, his book is not only um, exciting um, and revelatory, but it's also at the heart of, um, you know, at the heart of the book is also a plea. Um, he starts off with Kashmir, he talks about Bhopal, he talks about, about, um, about um, 1984. So I wanted to ask Dulat Saab, you know, at this point of time, um, you know, where, um, you know, you talk about the shadowy world, um, and in a way, your book is set at a point of time when if you look at OTT or this thing, the spy has really become India's superhero. You have this family man uh, who does all the things that we all wanted to do. Um, and, um, you know, in some ways, he has really become at the heart of the Indian nation. And I wanted to ask you, you talk about Kashmir. That's very, very important to you. And you say nothing in Kashmir is black and white. Right? Everything is a shade of gray. Do you think at this point of time we are looking at Kashmir in only in terms of black and white? Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. I know the star is Mandira, so I'm grateful to you. And uh, yeah, you know, when you talk about Kashmir, uh, I don't see anybody of my vintage here, but. Uh, yeah, Shashi is here. So, uh, if you remember the platter, sir, there was a, there was a song, Smoke Gets In My Eyes. Mm. And there's a beautiful line in it that says, there's something deep inside which cannot be denied. Mm. And that has been Kashmir for me. You know, I was in Bhopal. I had completed almost four years there. I overstayed in Bhopal because our normal tenure, outstation tenure was three years, and I was due to go back to headquarters in Delhi. But then I was asked to go to Srinagar, and um, I thought it may be good for my career. Also, I thought it would be a good holiday. So what started as a holiday became a, a love affair, a passion, Mm. And finally, it gets into your bloodstream and becomes an obsession. Like uh, Kafka says somewhere that he has followed his most intense obsessions mercilessly. I think that's what's happened with me in Kashmir, you know. It just doesn't go away. It's been a long time. Mandira mentioned, uh, you know, when I was in the PMO. Even that ended in 2004. Uh, when the BJP lost the election. But uh, Kashmir just doesn't go away. And uh, come every spring, my wife Paran and I still go to Kashmir. And uh, it reminds me of something else I came across uh, accidentally. There is this uh, much publicized, overpriced book, Prince Harry's. Uh, Spare, yeah. in which he says that in the abnormalities of life, the only thing he found normal and enjoyed was Afghanistan. So I could say the same about Kashmir, you know. We still love it, we still enjoy, still enjoy it, and we still go there. About uh, Kashmir being grey, that's true. And Delhi, unfortunately, has always seen it in black and white. We don't understand the greys. And I keep telling the, the Kashmiris, kya bahut harami ho, but ho bahut pyare. Because if you go to Kashmir, not, not just to, to holiday in uh, Gulmarg or Pelgam or Sonmarg or wherever it is, but go and interact with the, with the people of Kashmir, the people in Srinagar. You will find they are the kindest, gentlest, the nicest of people. So that's how it is. The grey comes from, you know, their deviousness and uh, what I call harami pana. 
But uh, I've uh, spoken to a lot of uh, Kashmiri leaders, including the Mirwais, who's presently locked up. And he said, yes, we, we tend to be a little devious, but that's what you taught us, because you've never spoken the truth to us. So we also lied to you. That's how it goes in Kashmir. But in this, you know, in, for someone whose profession in some ways is also about, as you say, trickery, and, um, um, you know, how do you then look at, you know, it's not only about a word that you use, say, harami pana, if you uh, sing it to this, but it is also about, and you talk about that, it's also about our neighbor. It's about Pakistan too. Um, how do you, you know, you've spent so many years, you've looked at track two, you are probably the only spy master who sat across his contemporary in, uh, and wrote a book, which is practically unthinkable of. So how do you look, I mean, in the sense, in this trusting and this non-trusting, and this harami pana, how do you put fit in Pakistan? And yeah, how do you look forward, especially now? Let me put it to you like this, that, you know, it was Kashmir which took me to Pakistan, really, because uh, when I started working on Kashmir, I realized that Pakistan was an, inher an inherent part of, of Kashmir. It's, uh, let me put it like this, that since 1947, what government of India has been trying to do, what Delhi has been trying to do, is to mainstream Kashmir and get Pakistan out of the Kashmiri mind, out of the Kashmiri head. And I think we've succeeded to a very large extent. Today, Kashmir is almost totally mainstream. The separatism, the separatists, the Hurriyatists that, that we used to talk about has all ended, it's all, all finished. And therefore, I had argued that actually we didn't have to do away with Article 370, 370. because there was nothing left in 370. It was only a, a fig leaf, yeah, you uh, which uh, provided the Kashmiri his little bit of dignity that he thought he, he had. Because actually, seven, uh, 370 ended in 75. Hmm. Those of you who follow Kashmir, when Sheikh Saab entered into an accord, and he said accession was irrevocable. So uh, it's like that. But uh, how I actually went to Pakistan was that uh, our former foreign secretary, Salman Haider, called me up one day and said, Mia, Lahore chaloge. I said, what are you talking about? Mm. <laughs> it's like saying, will you, will you come to the INA market with me? <laughs> and I said, kaise, kab? Bole, agle hafte chalenge. So I said, uh, who's going to give me a visa? Mm. I'll never get a visa. He said, hum dilwayenge, no? And so in January 2010, I went to Lahore or to Pakistan for the first time. And Mandira is, is right that I am the only intelligence chief uh, I mean, the only RNAW chief mm. who has visited uh, Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah. And I visited Pakistan four times during 2010 mm -hmm. and 2012. I've been to Lahore twice. I've been to Islamabad, and I've also had the good fortune of visiting Karachi. So mm -hmm. it was a great experience. After that, uh, like Mandira said, I've been on this track to uh, racket. You're, you're, you're a firm believer in the track to. Yeah, it was a track too. And um, that's when I got to know the Pakistanis better. And um, my friend Asad Durrani and I used to sometimes sit side by side. I remember at one of these shows in, um, I think it was Istanbul, mm. uh, Malni Parthasarthi of the Hindu was a few seats away. Mm. And she got up excitedly and took a photograph. And she said, I've got you. I've got you both spook <laughs> spooks together. And uh, so um, because we got along quite well, uh, Peter Jones of the University of Ottawa, who used to host uh, a number of these track to meetings, 
said to us, why don't you write something? Mm. And uh, General Durrani was very hesitant. I looked at him and smiled and he said, don't be silly. Even if we were to write fiction, nobody will believe us. <laughs> so, what we did initially was, we wrote two articles. Uh, one on intelligence cooperation, which was published simultaneously in the dawn in, in Karachi and in the Hindu in, uh, in India. And the second one was on Kashmir, which was trickier, and it, uh, it never got published, but it's still available on the University of uh, Ottawa website. So that was where it was, till I wrote uh, Kashmir, the Vajpa years. Mm. This book went to Pakistan. And I asked uh, General Durrani, I said, how is it being received? Because I, I, I thought Pakistanis would not uh, uh, like a lot, of, a lot of stuff that I had written. Mm. He said, it's been very well received. And then he said, you know, actually now we could write a book together. Mm -hmm. So that's how the Spike that Chronicles, Chronicles got uh, written, came yes. about. It's never happened be before, and I can tell you, it'll never happen again. True. So I wanted to also say, you said you were the only chief. You also, in your book, talk about another spy master, a current spy master. You talk about another friend, uh, the current NSA, Ajit Doval. And you say that there was, at some point of time, a conversation of bringing him across uh, to Pakistan, and the Pakistanis lost the chance. Can you talk about yeah. the Doval doctrine and the Dulat doctrine and this chance? No, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a doctrine. Uh, if Mr. Doval has a, has a doctrine, I, I don't know. People talk about it. But, uh, yeah, I, I, you reminded me of that occasion. What happened was that in course of time, uh, because uh, we used to meet the mostly Pakistani generals from across, so they started uh, a military-to-military -military dialogue. And then somebody came up with the bright idea that why can't we have a spooks dialogue on both sides? And once that started, uh, we found that actually we were talking much more openly, much more frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when we began to talk, suddenly uh, the Pakistanis complained, Not, nothing is happening. Everything is, is uh, status quo ante. So we must find a way to move forward. I said, I can give you a way to move forward. I said, just uh, invite uh, Ajit Doval to, to Lahore. And incidentally, Ajit Doval uh, attended the first two sessions of, of that track too. And then as uh, 2014 got closer, he knew which way he, had, he was headed. Mm. And so he opted out. But uh, the Pakistanis said, yeah, that, that should be doable. But uh, what if we invite him and he doesn't come? So I said, we can, we can do a check on that. And uh, there's a batchmate of uh, Ajit's with us on, on track two. So we asked uh, KM, we said, can you check up with Ajit, uh, whether he's prepared to go to Lahore? And at our next meeting, we told the Pakistanis that Mr. Dole is prepared to go to Lahore. And they said, we'll arrange it. But as so many things that the Pakistanis promise, it never happened. And I mm -hmm. think they missed a huge opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And so did we in some ways. In so, we keep missing opportunities. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, I know that there will be lots of questions. So, and I've been told that there are these things. So can we have the lady? Okay, there are lots of questions. Lady in front, right in pink. Hello, sir. So my question is, uh, whenever I talk to my Kashmiri friends, be it Kashmiri Muslims or Kashmiri Hindus, they talk about generational trauma, and they talk about the exodus, they talk about Kunan Pushpara, but on both sides, the uh, conclusion is that both India and Pakistan, they want Kashmir, but not Kashmiris. So how do you respond to that? Yeah, you know, this, this is a thing I've pointed out to my Pakistani friends uh, many times, in fact, I've had um, squabbles as well because they talk uh, with a lot of authority on Kashmir. And I said, you guys don't know Kashmir. You don't know the Kashmiri. Kashmir is India. We deal with them on an everyday basis, so we understand the Kashmiri. 
the Kashmiri will tell you something in Islamabad and he will say something else in, uh, in, in Srinagar. It's the same between Srinagar and Delhi, but at least we understand the Kashmiri. The Pakistani doesn't understand the Kashmiri. And actually, gradually, Pakistan is going out of the Kashmiri mind. It started, I think, a watershed moment was 9-11. Because I remember speaking to a senior Huriyat leader then, and I said, um, how do you see this? He said, ab kya hai? Jab ye apne aap ko nahi bacha sakte, to hume kya bachayenge? Pakistan is no use to us. So it started then, and then uh, my dear old friend, uh, Lone Saab used to say this also, and the Pakis were angry with him. But uh, I won't say that there are totally no followers of Pakistan in Kashmir. There still are. Uh, for instance, a, a new murmur has started in, in Srinagar, if you go there, they will tell you that Sheikh Saab made a huge mistake in 47, that Kashmir should have gone with Jinnah. But that's a very small, minuscule number. And it was the same people who in 47, the, these are the radical Jamatis, who in 47 said, these two Kashmiri Pandits, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and Pandit Sheikh Abdullah, because he was also descended from Pandits, they have settled the fate of Kashmir. Okay, so we have very little time, but lady, right here. In one of your interviews to Jyoti Malhotra, I believe, you said that uh, whatever is acceptable to Kashmir would be acceptable to Pakistan. So in that light, how do you see the recent, very recent unrest that has been happening, the recent bombings, the killings of children? How do you see that? Now, you know, your question actually uh, takes me to two things. Jyoti, of course, uh, is a friend. And she's quoting not me, but uh, Musharraf. Musharraf used to say this time and time again, that whatever is acceptable to Kashmir and Kashmiris will be acceptable to Pakistan. And I think that was the most reasonable statement to come out of Pakistan in the last uh, 30 years. What is the second part of your question? How did re recent bombings, the killings? Yeah, you see what's happening is that um, our current uh, muscular policy is paying dividends. Militancy has come down. But here I'd like to differentiate between militancy and terrorism. Militancy is, I, I like to look at it like this, our own boys who are involved, Kashmiri boys. Terrorism is what, is what comes from across. So my argument is that militancy has come down, will continue to come down, but terrorism will stay unless we sort it out with Pakistan. And that is why I say it's important to talk to Pakistan. And it's also important, although it's not relevant here, to talk to China. One, only one more question. So, and there are two things. Dulat Saab is signing books, so he will answer all your questions there too. Okay? So, uh, please. Mantra has had enough of me. No, no. I, I think you should remind everybody here the connection between you and me. So, Dulat Saab has, and I have lots of connections. Dulat Saab was, um, you know, fr was, I, we are post Punjabi. He can speak Punjabi, I can't. Uh, but uh, he was born in Sialkot, which my grandfather was born to. And we have another connection. My great-grandfather was Dulat Saab's first doctor. Dulat Saab used to sing, right? Absolutely. I, I was hoping you'd mention it earlier. But yes. uh, yeah. So the connect goes back a long, long time. There's another coincidence, you know, both um, Alama Iqbal, mm and Faz Saab, both were born in Sialkot, and both were Kashmiris. Yeah. So that's another Kashmiri Sialkot connect. Sialkot connect, yes. And, and Sialkot men, I mean, people from Sialkot, I mean, the story goes that if he's a Sialkoti, you can walk, they can walk and you can tell who a Sialkoti is. The Sialkoti Munda is supposed to be the best looking, right, of, the, of, of that. Is that what you're also claiming, Dulat Saab? Are you claiming that bit of the story or not? No, I'm not a Sialkoti. But, but you were born in Sialkot. <laughs> I was born in Sialkot. But you know, I must uh, say, your grandfather was ext always extremely, extremely kind to me. He was a kind human being, and he was always very kind to me. But that's what the heart of the book is too, right? About kindness and acceptance and talking. So thank you. We are being shown that at our time. Please buy a book. 
and you can get to ask three questions if you see, buy. See how fast time goes by. Yeah. Thank so, you all very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>